Welcome to today's webinar. County Health Rankings and Roadmaps is a program of the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute. This webinar is brought to you thanks to the contributions of colleagues and partners in Wisconsin and across the nation, with support from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. It is produced in collaboration with Healthy Places by Design, an organization that advances community-led action and proven strategies to ensure health and well-being for all. The University of Wisconsin-Madison occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place their nation has called Dejop since time immemorial. Today, UW-Madison respects the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation, along with the 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. This webinar will be recorded. All speakers' views are their own. Guest bios and slides from today's webinar are available on our resource page. We will share a link to the resource page when the webinar begins. Stay up to date on all things CHRNR. Find us on Facebook, X, and LinkedIn. And if you haven't already, sign up for our newsletter by scanning this QR code with your phone's camera. It's the best way to find out about upcoming webinars, our podcast, and our latest tools and resources. For your convenience, the QR code will also continue to be displayed for the remainder of this short video. Your facilitators today include our host, Erica burroughs Girardi, with support from CHRNR communication specialist, Colleen Wick, and the senior project director from Healthy Places by Design, Joanne Lee. We invite you to continue the conversation. Join our discussion group immediately after the webinar. Joanne Lee will be our lead facilitator and watch for a chat from Colleen for details on how to join the group after the webinar. Welcome to Community Driven Strategies to Address Persistent Poverty in Rural Areas. Hi, my name is Erica burroughs Girardi, and this webinar is the second in a two-part series that focuses on policies and practices that create or maintain unfair and unjust outcomes. We're also offering solutions that advance equity, belonging, and shared responsibility to address poverty. If you haven't already viewed part one of the series, which featured renowned poverty researcher, Luke Schaefer, be sure to watch it. It is available on demand, and we're going to share a link to that webinar in the webinar's resource guide, which you will receive tomorrow. CHRNR's webinars reflect the values that we hold as part of the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute. Values of collaboration, integrity, excellence, innovation, inclusion, and courage. These are the values that we aim to model during the webinar, and we hope that you will too. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce you to the team that will be aiding in your learning experience. And full disclosure, we are experiencing a bit of a storm here. So if I lose internet, this fabulous person, Joanne Lee, will actually conduct our interviews today. Hi, Joanne. Hi, Erica. We're, we're, we're keeping our fingers crossed that us. we won't <laughs> lose you. Um, but Thank you and welcome everybody to this month's CHRNR webinar. Um, we really want to invo invite you to join the conversation and engage with us during the webinar today. And there are two ways to engage. You can ask panelists questions by using the question box. So you can go ahead and open the Q&A box just so you have it ready. And this is a place where you will specifically pose questions as they come up, as they come to mind. And I will be managing or triaging the questions that come in um, and ready to pitch as many questions as we can to our presenters today. Um, you can also engage with other participants in the group chat. And Colleen Wick, my colleague, will tell you more about how you can engage in the chat. Thanks so much, Joanne. Hi, everybody. Um, like Joanne said, I will be monitoring the chat. I'll meet you there. So please use the chat to share knowledge or respond to questions that we may ask you. 
Uh, please also join us in making the chat space welcoming by adhering to a few guidelines. So use the chat to share successes, lessons learned, relevant resources, and links. Please engage in respectful dialogue. As you could see, if you're looking at the chat right now, our chat conversations tend to be very engaging. So if it's too distracting, uh, you could simply close the chat window in Zoom. Please also know that the views expressed by speakers and participants during this webinar are their own. They do not represent CHRNR or Healthy Places by Design. And again, if you have questions that you want the panelists to address, please use the Q&A box. And now I'll pass it to our technologist, Erin. Uh, Thanks, Colleen. Hi, everyone. I'm Erin Schulten. I'll be your technologist for today's webinar. If you have trouble with your sound or seeing the slides, please send us a message in the Q&A box and we'll do what we can to help you. Um, today's an exciting webinar. Our guests are very passionate about their work, so it'll be a fun day learning about rural America. And now I'll turn it back over to our host, Erica. Thank you so much, Erin, and thanks to the entire production team for everything you do every month to make our webinars awesome. Persistent poverty describes communities where at least 20% of the population has lived below the federal poverty line for 30 years or more. And this U.S. Census Bureau map shows the areas where we see persistent poverty in this country. We'll talk more about these regions later in the webinar, but know that there are reasons why these areas remain impoverished. Remember the term structural determinants of health? Those are written and unwritten rules, including policies, practices, traditions even, and narratives that determine how our society works. And here are a few examples of structural barriers that kind of sustain poverty. Dominant narratives like people living in poverty simply do not work hard enough. Narratives like that can influence policies that limit support to those in poverty. Rules that determine what counts as credit can hurt someone seeking to purchase a home. And when Dollars and I invested in spaces for communities to connect and engage, residents can feel disconnected or even excluded. So I'm excited to, to say that today's guests not only understand these challenges, but their organizations are addressing structural determinants of health by creating pathways to housing, jobs, education, and wealth building. As they share, I want you to listen for how their organizations are working to dismantle structural barriers. And when you hear them, place them in the chat. And with that, I want to introduce you to Emily Burleson. She's the Senior Manager of Advocacy and Research at Partners for Rural Transformation and meet Lissa Regeer, the President and CEO of Thrive Allen County. Hi, ladies, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Erica. Happy to be here. We'll have a discussion group right after this webinar to unpack what you're gonna to hear today. Please plan to continue the discussion with us during the, the video intro. You heard about our discussion groups that follow the webinar. They're facilitated by Joanne Lee, always engaging, giving you the opportunity to share with and learn from others. So Colleen's gonna chat out information at the end of the webinar so you can link to the discussion group and both Lisa and Emily will be joining us today in the discussion. So. Excited for that. So, Emily, I want to start with you because I want to let's dig into what is the work that Partners for Rural Transformation is doing, the difference that you're making in so many communities. It is a network. So, what is the purpose of your network? Hello. So, I would also just start with saying the Partners for Rural Transformation, you may also hear me refer to us as PRT. So the purpose of our network at PRT is to uh, eradicate persistent poverty, right? So this is a similar map that you've seen with Erica and maybe you've heard about persistent poverty in your last webinar with Dr. Luke Schaefer about uh, with the author of Injustice of Place. And if you haven't read it, please do. So our six partners are each living in and serving a region of persistent poverty. So you can see where our partners here are on the map. So our six partners are Fahi, Hope, Communities Unlimited, 
CDCB or Come Dream, Come Build, OISTA, and RCAC. So collectively, we cover about 78% of all rural persistent poverty counties. On the left-hand side, you'll see our six partners, but we also have other national partners as well, nine national partners who work diligently alongside us to help get us our work accomplished and have similar values and missions. And so the value of PRT for all of these partners is the partnerships themselves and the collective work we do on changing rural narratives and collecting and building rural data. And we offer a two-way street in this partnership. So I get to be uh, the recipient of uh, local, state, and regional level insights, and then I get to share federal and national insights down to our partners. A quick rundown of how PRT works and how we run is we have a steering committee that is essentially a governing board, if you're more familiar with that term. We have a deputies committee right underneath that, which helps us get our approvals done and go into the steering committee before we also don't have departments over here at PRT. We have what's called five working groups. So those five working groups include the fund development working group, lending, communications, and then the two that I run and manage, the advocacy and policy working group and the research working group. Yeah, thank you for that that introduction to your organization. Emily, you are like a little stilted for me, so you can turn off your camera to conserve. Um, bandwidth and people can still see your slides. Um, and I am going to ask Aaron to break in if I start having some issues so we can go ahead and transfer things over to Joanne. So Aaron, just let me know if we need to make that transition. Emily, um, CDFI, we hear the term a lot. Tell us a little bit about how they work and how they're different from banks. I can, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can. Perfect. So I will say that CDFIs are what we refer to as mission lenders, and they lend capital to places and geographies that it doesn't naturally flow. And um, just so we'll know, they're community development finance institutions. And how, you know, why would somebody want to choose a CDFI or this type of financial institution instead of a bank? Absolutely. So I'll start with um, PRT is not anti-bank. There's usually a dichotomy between banks and CDFIs that is a false narrative. PRT partners with the major banks and national banking systems and appreciate these relationships and get a lot of work done together. But with that, like I said, CDFIs are mission lenders. Uh, why people might prefer a CDFI over a bank is because in our regions, we see higher levels of banking deserts. We experience higher levels of branch closures. We see that the banks that do exist in our areas don't offer that retail banking. So they only do that deposit withdrawal services. And with that gap in banking, predatory lenders start to fill that gap. So what CDFIs offer is a stopgap for financial entities that are not predatory in nature and kind of fill in the gap where banks aren't there. Uh, CDFIs leverage dollars at an eight to one ratio, meaning that every dollar a CDFI gives, they are able to churn out $8 into the community. And what's different is in the healthcare system, you may have heard the term continuum of care. So we have a continuum of care model in CDFIs for the financial world. And that's what CDFIs really offer. We work with borrowers before, during, and after lending. So for example, if one of someone, a borrower comes to one of our partners and is quote unquote, not ready for some sort of mortgage or loan. We don't just say denied. We will work with them and give them small dollar credit building loans. So whether that be a hundred dollars at a time, $200, just to build up that credit to make sure they get the loan they need. We also offer auto loans to keep a family from slipping into poverty, just from one unexpected event or expense. And for one of our partners, if you miss one month's payment, you are not considered delinquent. You are considered delinquent if you don't stay in contact. Good standing is by staying in contact with them, and they want to make sure that they're in touch with you and know how to best help the situation. Yeah, most, that, go ahead. Go go ahead. ahead. Uh, most traditional lenders evaluate creditworthiness around the five C's, which people in the finance field may know, character, capacity, capital, collateral, and conditions. CDFIs add a sixth C for community. 
Oh, I love that. You know, I'm, I'm listening to what Emily is describing and I'm seeing some ways that some practices that CDFIs are using, that banks are not using, that um, are actually kind of dismantling some structural barriers. Let's see if if, if folks are picking on, up on that as well. And so, um, and if any of you living in rural communities, this may sound familiar, the fact that there are not as many banks, the fact that that gap is being filled with predatory lenders, that may sound familiar to you. Um, Emily, I want to ask you a little bit about PRT or Partners for Rural Transformation, CDFIs, because they even go a step uh, beyond. Like, how are they even different than the traditional CDFIs? That's a wonderful question. So, again, our six partners all have a CDFI function of their program, but they also, in addition to that, offer a broad range of services that are resulting from the direct needs of their communities. And that is out of necessity and because they have to, right? So they also, also offer healthy foods programs, home ownership, pre and post purchase counseling, technical assistance, safe water programs, youth programs, and so many more. Yeah. Um, you know, when we were talking, when, when I first met you, we were talking about how these pockets or regions that are persistently porous, it's not by accident. So can you unpack that a little bit more? Absolutely. So you'll see the same map that we saw earlier showing how these uh, persistently poor counties are tend to be clustered. And these are actually pretty representative where our partners serve. There are four main things that PRT is very open about when we talk about persistent poverty. First and foremost, that this is not an accident. These geographic clusters of persistent poverty are intentional based on past and present discrimination by both race and place. So something at PRT you hear us say is uh, spatial and racial discrimination. Secondly, there's chronic disinvestment by all major funding streams to these communities, including you know, federal, philanthropic, or private. In addition to this, all of these regions are survivors of extractive economies. So if we look at Appalachia, there was the coal, there was labor exploitation in the colonias, there was land taken from the natives, and there was slavery in the deep south, right? So these communities, even in 2024, are still trying to access basic needs. So for example, in 2023, a third of homes on Navajo reservations did not have access to electricity. There are communities today that around the country do not have water and wastewater infrastructure connected to their towns and their home. So these are communities that we tend to think um, the lack of basic needs is abroad, but it's still happening within our nation's walls. Yeah. And and for those of you who did not see the first webinar um, in this series, you definitely want to go back and, and, and look at that because Dr. Schaefer really goes into detail about the how these economies, the extractive economies aspect um, of these persistently rural areas. Emily, I, I want to ask um, for those of us in our audience, in the audience, um, who might be kind of squarely in the public health space, how can they work with a CDFI? So there are several ways that you can begin a partnership and a relationship with a CDFI. And I can definitely talk much more about it in the group discussion afterwards, but real quickly, they could be either another player in your capital stack or help you foster new partnerships or help connect you to those with similar missions. And how do your CDFIs work to honor community culture and traditions? And how has this approach influenced the project's success? Absolutely. So something unique about PRT to me is that our PRT partners move at the speed of trust, right? What does that look like? It, it looks like our six partners collectively have over 200 years of experience in these communities. You heard it when I opened this webinar and I say it everywhere I go that PRT partners live in and serve these communities. So we're not outsiders coming into you can't see me, but quote unquote, fix communities. We listen to them. We identify the needs that they articulate. And then we offer needed resources and support for sustaining the community driven goals. Yeah, that's that's amazing. I love it. 
And I was hoping that you could share some examples of how these projects have benefited um, um, the communities and provide wealth building opportunities for families. Absolutely. I have three examples lined up for today. So our first one is with our partner, Oista, who serves as the longest standing native CDFI intermediary. So CDFI intermediary serves and lends to other CDFIs. So we still lends to smaller native CDFIs across the country. There was a 1.5 million with an M dollar loan to support a joint venture in the eel aquaculture business. And that was given to Indian Township Enterprise. So for some context, eels have been a traditional food source of a tribe in Maine for centuries, and even more than half of the community members harvested baby eels as a part of their um, jobs or family growing up. Unfortunately, due to financial exploitation and heavy regulations, that caused inequitable access to the eel industry, despite their generations of their expertise. So now it is preferred that the eels are harvested and grown up in Asia and then shipped back to the US, which effectively locked out this native community from their own economy. So Indian Township Enterprise who got that loan used it to buy capital or used that capital to buy equity in the only eel distribution aquaponics center in the US. So when they became equity stakeholders, the tribe could take back community of their ancestral food system, create a market for their annual eel harvest, create new jobs, price their harvest fairly, or fairly stabilize fishery values, and had an economic output of $4 million a year back to this tribe. And having access to capital, food, and a stable income are all factors of having a healthier community. Absolutely. Yeah. How about the Hope Enterprise Corporation? Absolutely. So our HOPE partner covers the Mississippi Delta, and they found that in early 2023, 73% of white Americans were homeowners versus only 44% of Black Americans. So we can see that despite federal efforts, philanthropic and private efforts, this gap still exists and is still wide. So HOPE took a look at the communities that they serve and created a loan product specific for them called the Affordable Home Program, or AHP. So what is AHP? Every AHP loan is mainly underwritten to make sure that there is not discrimination based in those underwritings. There's also non-traditional avenues of credit considered, such as rent and utility payments. It defers student debt, so there's not a debt to income ratio obstacle when applying for a mortgage. There's no PMI required or, pers or private mortgage insurance which makes a lot of the mortgage payments unaffordable after the fact that is added on. They accept credit of 580 and up with most being under 620. And the LTV or the loan to value ratio is 100%, which is for folks who are not lenders. When you buy a home, you usually put down an LTV of 80% and you have to pay that 20% down payment. The 100% allows uh, the obliteration of the down payment barrier. So this, again, shows the importance of community-specific solutions in rural communities and how CDFIs are playing this role. Yeah, and we know that home ownership is one of the best ways to start building wealth. So it's awesome that they're doing that. And speaking of home ownership, um, share with us this, this example of what happened with this CDFI. Beautiful story. Absolutely. So this is a of our partners Come Dream, Come Build, or CDCB, based in the colonias at the U.S.-Mexico border. Dream Build was a program formerly known as Mi Casita, and this is an example of cultural needs being the base of CDFI innovation and the CDFI creating a product that is directly responsive to communities' needs. So in the colonias, CDCB noticed that housing and affordable housing is a really big need, and that families are living with conditions that are very much less than safe, sound, and healthy. They also noticed at CDCB that many families as a culture tend to build their homes little by little based on every paycheck they get. So maybe one paycheck, they're fixing a piece of their flooring in the kitchen. Next paycheck, they're focusing on a sink in the bathroom, so on and so forth. So they build their homes piece by piece as they can afford it. CDCB noticed this gap in this culture and decided to take action. So with several partners, including BC Workshop, Enterprise, and a bank, Wells Fargo, CDCB created Dream Build 
a modular housing products that allows our community to obtain home ownership. So it is essentially a modular housing program that can grow with a family. You may be asking how. So if someone were to apply for one of the dream build mortgages and they don't meet that criteria, they get micro loans to build that credit until they can access that mortgage. When ready, they get the mortgage. The families go online and design these houses. And these houses are indistinguishable from site built homes. They are built to be energy efficient, to be more affordable, and they are gorgeous. And you'll see some pictures up in just a second. And you can also see more on dreambuild.org. Um, after the families design their houses, the houses are built at the farm, which is a, a facility further away. And then the houses are delivered to the family's lot and then they can move in. What's truly unique about this is that the cultural piece comes in at this point is you get housed and you may have better credit, you're building your wealth. And let's say you decide to add to your family, you have a family member move in or have a child, you can now add additional smaller mortgage loans to build your home in pieces. You can add another bedroom, another bathroom, another spare room, because these houses are built to be added on as time goes on. So they can choose to grow their home in the way that they would culturally, but in a safe and sound manner. Yeah, it's just such a beautiful story. Tell us why it's worth the investment. Absolutely. So we get the rep all the time or the reputation of investing in these communities is risky. I would beg to differ and say that investing in these communities is not a risky investment. We have proven time and time in regions of persistent poverty that despite all odds, they will still, to quote Maya Angelou, like dust rise and be resilient and can you imagine the success of these communities when they already have the resources in a level playing field? So I see this as not investing in risk, but it's investing in a healthier and economically stronger nation. Yeah. Thank you so much, Emily, for sharing the, the wonderful work that PRT is doing in these persistently poor counties um, across the United States. And I know that there are lots of questions about what you all are doing. I hope you heard a, a lot of those structural barriers that she addressed. We'll talk about it later in the discussion group. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, and don't forget, you, we'll stick around for the questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's... Uh, Yes. Hello, everyone. Lisa, tell us about Allen County. Yes, I would love to. I'm so honored to be here and uh, representing my home community. So Allen County is located in Southeast Kansas. I am going to believe that everyone uh, in this webinar understands that Kansas is in uh, the Midwest. I like to kind of think of us as the heart of the nation. Uh, we are that uh, red star that you see there. We're 12,500 people spread over 505 square miles. And unfortunately, Southeast Kansas is the poorest region in our state. We have the lowest education levels, the worst health outcomes. Um, and in the late 1800s, early 1900s, so that was a very different story. We were a booming community in a booming uh, region. And that's because natural gas pools were found in our area. And this brought in so much opportunity and in work, including zinc smelters, which we know now create a lot of environmental waste and pollution that still haunts us to this day, creating health, environmental, and economic issues for our community. And we thought at the time that the natural gas would exist forever, but it did not. And when it ran dry, a lot of our community members left. At our height, we had more than 27,600 people in our community. And according to the 2023 census, of those remaining, uh, the 12,500 still here, 15.2% of people in Allen County are below the poverty line, which is 1.3 times the rate in Kansas. But it is also, I want to highlight, 2% less than the 2010 census. So we do feel like we're making a little bit of progress there. Although the poverty rate for children under the age of 18 in Allen County is 24.4%. So we have a long way to go uh, to make our vision of Allen County becoming the healthiest rural community in our state come to fruition, but we are making progress. So um, in 2017, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation honored Allen County as one of their Culture of Health Prize communities. To date, we are the only Kansas community to receive this honor. 
And that is because Allen Countyans are scrappy. We pivot when necessary, which is often, and we work hard to make progress. In 2007, we were hit by a massive flood that wiped out more than 100 homes on the south end of Iola, which is Allen County's largest town and our county seat at 5,500 people. Many would have thrown in the towel, uh, but our community rallied. We built new housing. We found ways to turn the flooded areas that were no longer able to hold, able to hold structures via FEMA guidelines into amenities to attract people to our community. A dog park, trails, an urban orchard, and a community garden were just a few of the things we did to ensure we made something good out of something bad. I love that term, scrappy. We're scrappy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so over the years, um, Thrive Allen County has made some significant shifts in how it has addressed health. So let's talk about that evolution, Lisa, and why it matters. Yes. So when Thrive uh, hired on our founding CEO in 2008, he began something we continue to this day. In fact, we have one of these tonight, uh, community conversations. We go into each town in Allen County at least once a year and sit down with their residents. We ask what's going well, what they're proud of, what could be better, and where are their barriers to making progress. At the end of the evening, we have a top three list that we vow to collaborate with them on over the next year or more. We started with these conversations, uh, getting directives on getting ditches mowed and putting up broken stop signs, flu clinics, countywide meltdowns to address obesity and work that could be done in the floodplain, the dog park and gardens uh, that I mentioned earlier. And then we began to progress uh, to intermediate projects city-owned fitness centers, working with city officials on pedestrian-friendly infrastructure and, uh, and policies as well. Over the past 10 years, we've been able to shift some of our focus away from that lower hanging fruit. And we've dealt with the food desert areas within our county, assisting a local family-owned grocery store to become a community-owned co-op creating a new revitalized area next to downtown Iola that includes a grocery store and 12 apartment units that were the first new market rate apartments in more than 20 years. We created Allen County's first public transportation since the days of the streetcar. And this began with a free bike share program that then highlighted the desperate need for true transportation solutions. We now provide public and safety net transportation to residents who need to get within two hours of Allen County one way. We work on statewide policy regarding childcare and early childhood access. We've created more than 60 miles of trails and routes in our county and led the efforts last year on the creation of Kansas's newest state park within Iola city limits. And we opened the first recovery house in our community to assist in addressing a major pervasive issue. So many of our community members in Southeast Kansas are facing, which is addiction. So I, I love how you kind of moved away from like, you call them low hanging fruit, but those programs that are so important, you know what I'm saying? They, they kind of put a bandaid over things that are broken or fractured, but then you started addressing like core wounds. You really are addressing like, what is at the core of what's keeping people, um, you know, keeping them strapped? Child care. We know that child care is expensive. You're addressing that. You are addressing ways for people to connect. And it all started with community engagement, with these listening programs. I'm so glad, I mean, listening um, sessions. So glad you're still doing that. I want to dig into more, to that more. So how has your projects promoted community engagement as well as build um, health opportunities? Yeah, so as I briefly mentioned before, we've been very intentional about building trails and routes throughout Allen County. And for Thrive, this really began in 2008 when we started to build the Southwind Rail Trail, which is a six and a half mile trail connecting Humboldt and Iola, which are our two largest communities. And something to keep in mind, Humboldt still teaches that Iola stole the county seat from them, which was in 1865. And I believe every community has this, um, the bad football call the stolen county seat, something that allows us to pit one community against the other. So when we built Southwind, we knew we were creating a way for our community to be healthier, but it became so much more than that. 
as volunteers worked on the creation of the trail, they built um, friendships that crossed town lines. And then as people started to use the trail, the same thing occurred. You'd keep seeing the same people on the trail. So after a bit, you'd strike up a conversation with them. That conversation would become a friendship and that friendship would become people from different communities bonding over shared interests. And a great example of this is our DQ Bike Club, a group from Iola rides to Humboldt. They meet up with people from Humboldt and they all ride to Iola for ice cream at, you guessed it, the local Dairy Queen. And then the Iola group disperses, the Humboldt group rides back to Iola. And a lot of bonding has occurred over bikes and ice cream uh, with a group that also helps maintain that particular trail. We also had huge community engagement statewide for the work we did to create Lehigh Portland State Park. And we had to get that creation approved by the Kansas legislature, both houses. So we rallied our community and others across the state to make it happen. And we were told it was amazing to have more than 100 individual letters, not form letters, uh, with stories and pictures, some even handwritten, that showed the support for that park. And it wasn't something this particular community committee was used to seeing. And that rallying of people that occurred was based on the trust that we'd built with them over the past 15 years. And that's that trust is what ensured that Lehigh came to fruition. That trust is what allows us to do everything. You are truly partners with the community. I love that. So let's talk a little bit more about what these community listening sessions look like because they have allowed you, like you said, to build so much trust, but also agency. People feel empowered with this. Yes. So share a little bit more about these listening sessions and how you have been able to learn about specific needs that, that the community um, express. Yes. So, uh, Eric, as you uh, mentioned, we do hold these community conversations in every community in Allen County at least once a year. And, and one of the examples I like to give is uh, in 2019, we were in the small town of Savenberg. It's 75 people on the eastern side of our community. They have a larger homeschooling community and a railroad that dissects the town. And two of their top priorities were not one, but two storm shelters to ensure if inclement weather was approaching at the same time as a train, their community members had shelter, whichever side of the tracks they were on. Second, they wanted a playground. In more than 100 years of Savenberg's existence, they had never had a playground. And the third, they needed their cell service addressed. Um, what they shared with us was a little chilling, honestly. The best place to receive cell service was in their cemetery. Can you imagine knowing that your loved one was having a heart attack and running to the cemetery to ensure you had the best coverage to make that 911 call? The foreboding and ominous overtones of making that call from a cemetery, you can't make it up, it was bad. Um, so these projects took a bit longer for us to accomplish with this community, thanks to COVID, but actually, they also happened because of, because of what COVID provided in the terms of ARPA dollars. So these ARPA dollars that came down into our counties assisted with storm shelters because we were able to go to the county and tell them of our smaller communities that needed these shelters because they were coming up in these conversations. Our community engagement director won three grants to assist Savenberg with their playground. And then the phone company was already luckily working on getting a tower and better service to that part of the community, because that's obviously not something Thrive on Our Own can do. So it all came together within a two year time frame. Uh, so for the next community conversation, because one was postponed due to COVID, we were able to start completely fresh with Savenberg because all of their top items had been addressed. And these are items that we never would have known about had we not been in conversation with this community. Right. I mean, you would never have learned about the trauma that someone has to experience about making calls in a in a cemetery from a survey. Yeah. So yeah, having that and then knowing how to to leverage these dollars has actually been a a, a boon for your community. You know, one of the things that we we've been talking about is the the power of narratives because <laughs> they can influence all sorts of decisions for good or bad, right? Including yes. budget allocations, how you address poverty. We talked about that earlier. What is a dominant narrative that Thrive has had to shift in order to, to be able to make things happen in your community? 
Yes, uh, the dominant narrative that we deal with is the scarcity mindset. The idea that it can't happen here because we don't have the resources to make it happen. And we can't do what needs to be done until we know we have the funding and resources to do it. And we combat this narrative by promoting collaboration over competition. Too many people believe there is only one pie, and once the pieces of that pie are gone, you're going to starve. There's no more dessert for anyone. Instead, we need to think of our work and the opportunities for our communities as though we're living in that pie shop. There's not just one pie, there's a myriad of pies, and they're constantly baking more in the back of every different variety, more than enough to go around. Plus, we identify the problem and then we figure out the way to address it, whether that's grants, fundraising, resources, connections, and we do that, we address it. We don't let the lack of something at the beginning uh, get in the way of us making progress on something. So what my mentor taught me was to fight the scarcity mindset with everything I have, that every time we found an issue we needed to address, that we have always found a way to address it because we refused to believe we were stuck without resources. Yeah, the power of, of a narrative, so yeah. So lastly, we know that when residents take ownership of community challenges and engage with policy makers, like change often follows. So how has Thrive Allen County been supporting residents in building power and then taking that power and, and doing something with it? Yes, so we've been able to make progress in so many different areas over the past 17 years. And one of the areas I am so excited to see growth in is with the community being willing to step up and advocate for themselves. We held a community conversation in the small town of Carlisle, an unincorporated community that holds 200-ish people, if you're including its surrounding areas, otherwise you might say about 20. Uh, as the community discussed their needs, a gentleman named Mike, you can see him on the bottom right of your screen, uh, said they needed to address the county commission. And I told them we could take their, their asks to the commissioners and and because that's what we usually would do and he responded lissa we really appreciate all thrive is done and that you would represent us in front of the commissioners but we need to do this ourselves we need to address the commissioners on our own and in my head i was cheering wildly because this is exactly where you want to get your community members this place where you have them empowered to advocate for themselves and so that community met with thrive multiple times to prep for their meetings with the commissioners and they were very well prepped and they still come to us for any kind of assistance that they need funding talking points etc but after they work with us they do the actual communication on the advocacy and education part with their local officials and it's been phenomenal to see that growth and it's not just with one small community it's happening all over. Our three senior high school interns this year held youth-led community conversations at each of our three high schools. And in fact, they held our largest conversation to date when they had more than 300 students show up in Iola. And after each of these conversations, our interns would take what they learned and present the information to county commissioners, school boards, and city councils to ensure our elected officials are aware of the priorities of our young people. And finally, uh, with the creation of Lehigh Portland State Park, uh, as I said earlier, we had hundreds of people from all over the state support us in the endeavors. But my favorite examples of empowering our community members in this area of advocacy was with our young people. That picture on the bottom left, uh, that is my 10-year-old uh, niece at the time, who is testifying in front of the House Agriculture Committee on why creating Lehigh Portland State Park was so important to her uh, and her generation. Um, we had so many children write letters and get involved with this process and it truly gave me hope for our future. And I think that years of working authentically with our community has created trust and collaboration that can only happen over time. Our community has seen what happens when we work together, take calculated risks, and think towards the future. And we've been able to prove that good things can and will happen. In fact, they have and they will continue to. And I'm often reminded of the Margaret Mead quote, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed individuals can change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has. 
We are small, but we are mighty when we work together to make effective changes. Yeah. Thank you so much, Alyssa. And I, I love that quote my, myself. I'm an anthropologist, so very, <laughs> very much familiar to me. Um, I did get thrown off for just a second off of Zoom. So when I did that, um, I missed sharing a slide. So hopefully you all saw the dominant versus transform narrative slide. And here's a slide of the beautiful pictures of your community and the work that you all have done. I love how you're empowering, um, how you are actually encouraging young people also to be involved with decision makers and policy makers, because obviously they're they're the future. Um, so thank you for sharing your story. So um, I'm gonna pause. I'm gonna turn off my camera. I'm gonna do whatever I can to you know like say some bandwidth and go in. You're saving the day. <laughs> well, appreciate that, and please just do what you need to do to stay with us, Erica. We don't want to lose you. Um, but I do want to welcome Lisa and Emily back um, because we have several questions queued up for you, and I'm just going to kind of bounce back and forth so that we can address as many of them as possible. So know that we've got more questions for you than we can answer during this uh, Q&A portion of the webinar, but we've got the discussion group later. Um, and also just try to um, keep your uh, answers as concise, as concise as possible so we can get to a bunch of questions. It's clear that you both provided not only really great information about how to address poverty in rural communities, but very inspirational examples. So thank you. I am going to start with Emily because you got folks so excited in sharing the example of Dream Build. Um, so one participant wants is curious, what are the main funding sources for Dream Build? And what is sort of the longevity of these homes? Um, what areas do you typically see these types of modular homes being built? And are there any legal barriers in place that might prevent some, you know, a program like Dream Build from happening in another community? Absolutely. So I'll start with the first part of that question. And if I forget any of the subparts, <laughs> just remind me. But uh, main funders, I listed the partners that were involved, and I think all of them had a play in the capital stack. But I do think this is one of those projects where it took a bunch of people and a, def a bunch of different kinds of funding to put it together. So um, I would say it's the typical rural hodgepodge of capital stacking to get it done and over the finish. Leveraging. Yes, <laughs> exactly. And um, I believe the second part of that question was longevity of the housing in other states and moving it and seeing if it can scale up. Longevity, these houses are new, so I can't really speak to for like solid numbers, but I will say they are very well built. They're very energy efficient and they are extremely sound, safe and healthy. So um, I foresee these homes being decades long investment and standing and building some familial and generational wealth. Yeah. And the fact that you can, they're built, they're designed so that you can add rooms is, I think, speaks to the fact that they are looking at longevity. Um, so Lissa, you talked about a lot of things that um, Thrive Allen County is doing, so inspirational. And one participant picked up on the fact that you do try to address policies, you know, get at that more sustainable impact, um, and was curious about policies focused to address food security and housing access. Um, can you share which policies you if which new policies you were able to advocate for um, versus ones that were already existing local policies? So we, yeah, these are really good questions. And, and I'm gonna say, I think kind of difficult questions. Uh, in our early existence, uh, prior to me being CEO, I, I got to take over uh, the reins in 2019. Thrive was heavily involved in creating the Grow Food and Farm uh, Council. Uh, and they exist to truly work on the, po the food policies in our community. And so, uh, at Thrive, we understand that we we fill in the gaps uh, where there is where there is a gap, and then we try and create what is needed and allow that to live on its own outside of us. That way, there's more work spread around for everybody to do. So they have taken on a lot of that, as well as um, what I would say policy wise uh, with food systems. I wouldn't say on the policy side we've been as strong as on the infrastructure side, mm -hmm. where we worked so hard to get a grocery store here in Iola because ours closed in 2008 and we didn't have one again until 20, 
17. Um, and then a, a local grocery store that was closing because the family could not sustain it anymore. And we were able to work with that community to create a co-op. And I always laugh because I think you think of a co-op and you think of a little crunchy and, a, and <laughs> this is, this is not that, uh, this is very, uh, gray haired, uh, uh, members of a co-op because this community is older and they needed their grocery store and they fought for it and they have it now as a co-op. Um, so I think of, of ways like that where we have be better on infrastructure right now. Um, housing is one we're currently working on. And uh, that's another infrastructure one where we've worked very much, uh, we work on rezoning in our communities to ensure that we can have uh, apartments instead of single family homes, because we know our newer generations, our younger generations are not necessarily looking for those single family homes. Uh, we also look at how can we, we just received a, a loan that we're wrapping up through USDA, where we were able to work with people living in poverty, where we could put new roofs on their homes, we could put accessibility features into their homes. So a lot of what we've done is infrastructure in the two areas you're talking about. Uh, we work statewide on policy with uh, Medicaid expansion, with uh, child care and early childhood development access, uh, but mainly infrastructure on the two you great. mentioned. Yeah, good. No, and there, there are policies like rezoning. That's a policy to get at the infrastructure. Thank you. So I'm going back to Emily and you really did a really nice primer on CDFIs before like, oh, what is this? Like, I really need to know more about this. Um, so one question was, what are the safeguards for CDFIs? How do we ensure that these institutions don't become predatory when working with these marginalized communities? I thought it was a great question. I love that question. So one of the things that CDFIs have as a safeguard is they are all certified through the CDFI fund, which is under treasury. So if you go to the CDFI fund website, which I think is cdfifund.gov, you can go and get a list of all of those certified CDFIs. And that has a ton of qualifications of so much percent has to be given to uh, target markets in certain communities. There are rules of what percent has to, of your entire work has to be community development focused and a bunch of other policies that enable you to be a CDFI and not kind of fall into any, you know, uh, predatory lending practices. Great. All right, Lissa. So when you started talking about community engagement and had some very specific tools and approaches, people got really excited. Um, with community conversations, I know this could be a long workshop about how to do those, <laughs> but if you could just give a high level quick view uh, about whether there's a particular format for mm -hmm. community conversations and if there's you know a place on the website that um, people can go to for, for to go more in depth. Yeah, so we don't have any um, anything on the website that would show you how we do what we do with the community conversations. But what I will say is every community is different, but we approach them all the same. Uh, in our smaller communities, we get a very wide, uh, a high percentage of people showing up. So Mildred, town of 17, this past year we had 16 people show up. Tonight at our Iola community conversation, the percentage is not going to be anything like that out of 5,500 people. Uh, but what I will say is we are very... Um, informal about it. Uh, we come in, we introduce ourselves, we have everybody sitting around tables, we ask uh, what's going well. We have um, one of my team members has a huge post-it note uh, pad that we write everything they talk about on so everyone can see everything that's being written. So if we write something down wrong or we mishear something, someone can very quickly tell us that we have. Um, we go through what's, what's going well, what's not, where they'd like to see their community in 15 to 20 years, how we ensure that their community gets to that place in 15 to 20 years, because a lot of them say, if we continue where we are, then we won't be here then. So we're fighting for that. I will also say, and I think this is so important to share, a lot of people are not comfortable speaking out in public. So we give a lot of other uh, options as well. We put pieces of paper on the table so people can act like they're writing notes, even if that's not what they're doing, but I say scribble, doodle, write notes, whatever you want. And also, if you're not comfortable sharing out loud, Write down your questions or your comments to us. Give them to us at the end of the night. If you want us to talk to you about it, give your contact information. If you just want us to know it, that's fine too. It can be anonymous, but that way we hear everybody. We also go online. We, we hold these online as well. So if people can't show up in person because of childcare issues, because of whatever, they're too tired to make it, um, or they're not comfortable being with a lot of people, we try and give as many options as possible for them to be involved in the conversation. That's really critical. There's no one way for people to engage. The personalities, um, 
um, the formats have to be have to appeal to a wide range. All right, so this question is for both of you and um, such a great question, but how with, with the respective areas and what your organizations have been able to do, how would someone get a start in their community? Um, do you go to a certain organization first? Do you talk to a policymaker like the mayor? Um, and I'll start with you, Emily. Thank you. So that's a really beautiful question. And that's kind of the question that we start with every day at PRT is like, so now what? And what? how do we do this? And so I think all of the above of what you just said, Joanne, identify all of those stakeholders, whoever that may be. And that's top down, bottom up, middle out, all of those things. And just figure out every single person who should have a say in this community, gather them in one room, much like Lisa's doing in, in her community and having those conversations and building connections and networks so that it's really easy for a community member to say that they feel comfortable talking to their local representative or having that local representative really understand the experiences and the obstacles and the wants and the needs of their community and also being able for the community to come together and say, this is what we see as success. This is the solution we wanna to work towards because an elected official working towards a solution that maybe the community isn't on board with is not a successful one. Right. So getting everyone on the same page is essential. So getting everyone in the same room, whether it be a physical room or virtual is critical. Thank you. Lisa? Yeah, I echo what Emily said. Uh, we've worked with a lot of communities across Kansas and also in uh, additional states as well to start something like Thrive. And what I would say is we were started by a group of 25 to 30 people in our community that just said we're tired of the brain drain, we're tired of businesses closing, we're tired of people getting less and less healthy. And they came together and it was their action and their idea that something needed to change that sparked that. And that was a very vastly different group of people. And I think you do need your leaders, especially if you, as you're starting, you have to have that buy-in, but you've got to have your community. And it's why, uh, it's why these community conversations to us are so important. It authentically engages us with that community. And I would say also, if you are thinking about doing this kind of work, I would highly encourage to be inclusive of, of those conversations into into your work because it open I won't lie I kind of dread them every time because you have no idea what's going to show up but I feel so energized at the end of them because people come because they care mm -hmm. because they want their community to succeed and they have ideas on how to make that happen and those are the people you want at the table to help you move forward absolutely perfect thank you both so much we we got to as many questions as we could and for those i'm so sorry we didn't get to your questions but remember we have the discussion group um to just toss more ideas around so i will hand it back to erica thank you so much joanne yes i think that's going to be an amazing discussion group so please make sure you join us colleen's putting a chat in a in a um putting a link in the chat right now um, to a survey. And I'm just asking you to complete this, this survey. Um, we do read your feedback. And so we would appreciate hearing about your thoughts about today's webinar. Now, we've been talking a lot over the course of this series about policy and how policy can actually influence poverty. And so policy is key to change. So join us next month as we dig into strategies for how you can engage with policymakers. We're going to hear from Blair Bryant with the National Association of Counties and Dr. Keisha Pollock Porter, a professor at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. So they're going to be discussing what policymakers need to know from you to make decisions and how you can lean into your power as a public health advocate um, to approach policy with an equitable lens. So join us next month. Again, we're going to have a discussion group right after this webinar to unpack what you hear today, well, have heard today, rather. So please um, plan to join us, and Colleen's going to go ahead and chat that link out right now. Joanne's going to be there, Lissa and, and Emily are heading over there right now. And so please plan to join us in that discussion group. And of course, stay connected with us. Um, the best way to get to stay connected, 
remain committed to stay or remain. I will get one of the words out eventually. Connect it with us is to sign up for our newsletter. Um, we also have a presence on X, formerly Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. So please um, make sure that you stay connected with us in one of those ways. Again, thank you for your patience as I hopped on and off with these internet issues. We do think it's probably a Zoom issue, by the way. Um, we're going to cross our fingers that we make it through the discussion group as well. Thank you for everything that you do to advance equity in your communities, and I will see you next month. <laughs>